Well, well, you know, you what know can you do? Traffic. Uh, I'll tell you what, if it wasn't you, I wouldn't have even come. You, you wouldn't even be bothered. No, I'm going to move so, this well, uh, belt. Okay. This is my belt here for the All best right. broadcaster in combat sports. Oh, con no congratulations. Thank you. Thank I'm, now so nice I'm, a, I'm now a combat sports expert after going to UFC London. Well, we have a lot to so talk about. Go. I mean, we were supposed to have 45, but I was just told by Fred that we're only getting 30, despite the fact that you are tardy, but that that's okay. A long time. Yeah. I see you giving IFL 30 every freaking true, week. That is true. Every and week. You do much bigger numbers. And it's so. the same old questions every week. We won't get into all of that. You look fantastic, by the way. Right. Down a few pounds, yes? Yeah, I was trying to, I was 118 kilograms. And I kept. What is that? That's like. Uh, like 200 and. Uh, 50 odd pounds like and I, I kept seeing these heavyweights weigh in and i'd look at them and i would think wow you're in tremendous shape and then i'd go i'm 20 pounds heavier than you yeah, so yeah, yeah. i'm trying to get to 105 i'm okay. two key two kgs away and what are you more. doing training eating well no alcohol oh wow feeling great okay something i you know this is not your typical question but i think about this as i get older we're around the same age you're 42 so, yeah turning 40 this year uh you have two kids yeah how many days a week do you think that you are away from home? In, excuse me, days out of the year do you think you're away from home? And how does that affect you as a father? Because I, I wonder about, I worry about these things a lot, especially weekends, right? They're playing sports, they have activities. Mm. You're never there on the weekend, right? You're either in mm. Spain or New mm. York or Vegas. Mm. How do you do this? So you have to, if you want to excel at what you do, you have to make terrible sacrifices in your life. Now, life is about balance. And life is about understanding what's important and what's not. So unfortunately, people with incredible drive and people who love to win are also very selfish. Mm. So the answer is, unfortunately, that you have to make sacrifices that will affect your ability to be, in that instance, a good father. But I grew up that way. So my dad was away all the time. And the only thing my dad cared about, well, I say cared about, he cared about me, but the drive that he had was to be successful. And everything else was secondary. So the reality is that it's only actually as you get older, you start to think, well, you know, what is success? So we're going a bit deep here, Ariel. I like what, this. what is success to you? And, and how do you determine success? When I was younger, the way I determined success was very different to how I determine it now. It used to be, can I hit those numbers? You know, can I beat the opposition? You know, can I do the biggest show? How many tickets can I sell? Now success is more about feeling. You know, it's about feeling good. Mm. And it, uh, many different things can give you that. It's fulfillment. But fulfillment comes in many different ways. For some people, fulfillment comes in staying at home and being a stay-at-home dad and just being around your kids. So some people, fulfillment comes from winning and excelling at what you do. So the mix is right. I haven't really answered your question. Mm. But what I will say is it is impossible to be a standout father when you're so driven in your chosen industry. And you see it with sports people all the time. You have to make horrible sacrifices. But you also, when you're there, you have to try and be present, which is very hard because the phone's going off and you're trying to do that deal and you're thinking about that event and you've just read someone on social media call you something and now you're a bit angry. Mm -hmm. So never take yourself too seriously. Do but, you feel guilty? Uh, I, I, I'm sure you miss things, yeah, right? I miss, yeah, I do. And I, I, when I'm there, I'm like, Super dad, mm. right? So I'm doing, I'm 10 times more effort than I would if I was there every day. So, but it can't, you know, I'd hope that, and I hope my children have the same passion for what, they find a passion and a love for what they do and they chase their dreams. They, they have that feeling of fulfillment. And to do that, you have to make sacrifices. It's not for everybody. You know, being the top and the best at what you do is not for everybody. Making those sacrifices is not for everybody. You know, people say, oh, wow, you're living the life. Wow, you've got New York this week. You've got Vegas next week for Canelo. Then you're in Italy. Then you're in Spain. Then you're back at the O2. It's like, yeah, but it, it, it's tiring, mm -hmm. you know, and it comes with, with sacrifices. But how bad do you want it? That's what life comes down to. How bad do you want it? How big do you want to make this show? How successful? Do you want to make the show? Are you willing to make sacrifices that will affect your life to be the very best at what you do? And if you're not, no problem. It's not for you. But I want to win. I want to be the best at what I want to do. I want to take over the sport globally. That's the drive that I have, and I understand the sacrifices that come with it. Uh, before you came in, as I was trying to waste time, you know, because <laughs> traffic and everything, uh, I called you the best promoter in combat sports. You believe this, right? 
combat sport. I'm not talking boxing. Yeah, I you mean, you are the best right now. I don't know. I mean, I, I I sometimes read that you don't have a great relationship with Dana White. I don't really know the. I'm background. not trying to take a shot. No, I'm no, just no being but, honest. But what I'm saying is, is I'm not in awe of Dana White, but I have huge respect for him as a promoter. So if you say to me, "Are you the best promoter in boxing?" It's not even close. Genuinely, not even close. But Dana White, I see as a trailblazer in terms of promotion, not just as a promoter, but in terms of the business, the brand, the way that that sport or that that brand has penetrated the global combat market. So, and and for me to not answer that question with I absolutely I am is quite. You know, it's a massive credit to Dana White because my ego's out of control. So I, I can't I, I can't sit here and say I'm a better promoter than Dana White. Like I, I just I don't know because the proof is in the pudding in terms of the growth that that business has had. Whether that's down to him, but the model is quite similar. You know, I recognise that if I could build my platform and my brand, you're not solely dependent on talent in terms of your commercial deals and your broadcast deals. You know, so Dana White and the UFC have built a product where they can go into new territories, they can sell out arenas without you actually knowing who's fine. You know, I mean, I was at the London event. People knew that Molly was on and people knew that Paddy was on, but UFC were coming to London. Yeah. Get your tickets. And that that's, you know. Sort of so, like WWE, right? Same. And we, we, that's the same as what we're trying to do. You know, you have your own production values. The production is in-house. You control your own narrative. You control your own shoulder programming, digital content, you know, you, you build your social media team. We're, we're only following in suit of UFC. And I always say that we copy a lot of what they do. I have no problem saying it, but, you know, we're, we're, we're the closest thing to UFC in boxing. And, of course, we're going to talk about Taylor Serrano. I have a lot of strong feelings about this. In fact, when I was on the DAZN Boxing Show in December, they asked me, what's the fight you're most looking forward to in 2022? Before this was even done, I said, this one. They were all like, ah. I'm like, of course it's this one. <laughs> so I've been driving this train for quite some time. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. But we did see you in March at the O2 mm. next to Dana. And there was one time when they cut to you guys, and you were, like, talking. In his oh, ear. that was a mistake. What bro. happened? What happened? Because what were you telling them? They came to me. So the, the whole situation is... People were saying to me all week, are you going to the... Like he said to me, you've got to come to London, to UFC. But, and then people were asking me if I was going. And I was like, I don't really want to call Dana and ask him for a ticket. Like, yeah, you don't so, to... so I just thought, oh, I'm not going to go. Anyway, about six o'clock, literally, on the night, wow. Dana said, messaged me and said, are you coming? I was like, well, no one's really said anything. I was at <laughs> home, I was having a bit of dinner. I was like, do you know what? He said, you've got to come. So I was like, straight in the car, drove down there. His people met me at the back gate of the O2. Next thing, I'm sitting next to him. So it's got Dana White on the thing and Eddie Hearn. I'm like, blimey. So, and they're like, AJ, yeah. and like, they were behind me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were going, how's he sitting there? So, um, and again, like, I can only take people off face value. Dana has been incredibly hospitable to me. You know, the hospitality he showed me that night, he talked me through everything, you know, explained the fighters, the yeah. techniques, everything. And I was, I was fascinated by it because... It's only when you become educated about sport, you start to actually understand the beauty of it. To me, as an outsider, as a casual, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a tear up and it's violent and you don't necessarily understand the different disciplines and skills involved. So I became a fan, the energy was great, different kind of audience, you know, just in the respect of, you know, that they knew who I was, but it wasn't like being at a boxing match where I, you know, and, and even AJ and other, other people that were there. Um, just interesting watching the ring walks, the time between fights, you know, the trust, the lighting, the screens. What was you know, your biggest takeaway? What did you like the most from what you saw? I liked the consistency in terms of the speed of fights coming in. Sometimes across our production, we'll feel too much. Mm. And sometimes you can lose the flow. I don't know if that's generic across all UFC events, but it was, you know, fights over, quick interview, two minutes, a little bit of music, ring walk. Yep. Right. And, and that's, that's a nice flow. Surprising that the fighters don't get introed before the ring walk, very different to boxing. Mm -hmm. You just hear some music and what's going on? I, I, yeah. I didn't really get it. And then he's by the cage or she's by the cage and right. then they get introed in the ring. Um, just a good energy, you know, good energy, good product. Um, so, yeah, I, I sat there, I watched the whole thing. Like, I'm a big Molly McCann fan. She's, you know, she does work with us and I love Molly. And Paddy, I don't really know, but I love his energy and, you know, and Aspinall and all these guys. And, you know, it's, I think it's made 
Dana, I think he was saying, you know, during the night, I think I have to come back here. You know, all the UK guys have won. So, you know, I guess they'll be back in the summer or whatever. And um, I really enjoyed it. It's just nice to see something different and always learning, always talking, always learning, always thinking. And, um, you know, you, you can learn a lot from, from those events. When you were watching, were you like, hmm, MMA, I like this? I don't know. I mean, pe people always say to me, and we've had loads of approaches from investment companies. We'd like you, you know, could you back an MMA project? And it's like, people talk about Dana in boxing. And you have to have a passion. Like, for, personally, I love boxing. I've been around boxing since I was eight years old. Right? And I have such a huge passion for the sport that I can sit at ringside, scream and shout, and just be totally engrossed in what I'm watching. And I see that in him. Mm. You know, oh, oh, you know, still, you can, as many fights as you watch, to still have that passion and energy. And that's the love for what you do. So I, I find it difficult to get involved with something that I don't have the same passion for. And I don't yet have that passion for MMA. I, I'm a fan now, I think, sort of borderline. But who knows in time? But, you know, I don't think Dana could have that same passion and energy in boxing, to be honest with you. And I don't think I could have it in He's MMA. tried to get into boxing. Yeah, he's done a few bits and pieces. But yeah. again, like the model's different. Obviously, yeah, the, totally you know, different. The, 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 the balance sheet is different. Everything's different. And the control is different. And I go back to the building of the brand. What they've done so well, Dana and the UFC, is create a model that's not totally reliant on talent. You know, in boxing, you kind of rely on talent, really, whether it's Canelo or AJ or Fury. Like you, and but I, I kind of get the feeling with UFC, they want to create stars, but they want to just, you know, and like once you get someone who's outspoken and powerful, like Connor, mm -hmm. it becomes a nightmare for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's day to day in our world because we're dealing with egos, personalities, agents, managers, and and everything, and and we probably we don't we let them get out of that that box where I feel like the UFC do a great job to almost like the brand is bigger than the fighter. 100%. Would you ever want to institute a uniform? Have all the fighters like wear a, the same like thing? Like a universal contract on fighters and no, stuff? No, no, no. Like, like literally wear the same thing. Oh, right. Uh, no. You noticed that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like fighters to create their own personality and individuality. And I feel a lot of that can come within their fight kit. You know, and, and the ring walk music and, and the way they express themselves. Um, we're involved with 10 other sports. You know, we're, we're governing bodies in many of those sports. And, you know, I understand the, I understand the system. Um, I don't think it hurts what they're doing. You know, that, that's the UFC model. But for me, I like to see the individuality of, you know, whether it's Katie Taylor, you know the kit that Katie Taylor wears. That's her colours. Mm -hmm. You know, that's her ring walk. That, that's her... Uh, you know her training kit at media day and stuff like that and it's a good way for a fighter to express their own personality so i was talking about taylor serrano and there's three things that i love so much about this and and i know you've echoed some of this obviously madison square garden 143 year history two women have never headlined in boxing or mma obviously mma is newer but still significant now there might be some person in liverpool who doesn't care about msg and that doesn't mean anything to them well how about the fact that it's number one versus number two. Mm. That never happens. 2008 was the last time in boxing that it happens. It never happens in MMA either. Maybe one time in 2014 with Daniel Cormier and John Jones. I'm trying to explain to mm. this audience mm. why this is a big deal. Mm. And then, oh, by the way, if this audience doesn't care about any of that, it's a co-promotion. And that mm. never happens in, mm. in our sport as well. It's MVP and it's Matchroom. And I know you guys are pushing it, you know, mm. doing all the, but you know, it's significant that she's a Jake Paul fighter mm. and Nikisa involved. Amanda, I'm talking about all these things make for this to be such a historic, massive moment. I feel it in this city. Like, mm, I, I mm. are you now? You've been here a couple of days. Yeah. Are you surprised? I can't believe it. You can't believe no. it. No. I mean, yesterday we went to the Empire State Building. Um, I'm being explained what's happening. They're going to light up this model, and they're going to put the Irish colours around this just this model Empire State Building model and Puerto Rico at the top. And I said, oh, that's nice. And they said, yeah, on Saturday, we, we will light up this building with Ireland and Puerto Rico colours. I'm like, can I pretend that's my idea? Yeah. You know, and, and it was just, like, that just, that shows you in itself. The Today Show, those, yeah. those guys, the, the, the girls were on yesterday. I can't get fighters on the Today Show, you know, in a standard event. The, the media that are here this week, the different kind of media, like, it is incredible how big this fight has become. And, you know, when we talk about women's sport, there is a real consistency among broadcasters and, and commercial organizations to think 
let's support women's sport because it's a good look. Yeah. It's a box ticked. This breaks through the barriers of that. And Katie Taylor has taught me that, you know, that, that mindset of it's a good look, that's not equality. That's disrespectful to women's sport. Women's sport and women's boxing needs to maintain its position through quality, through demand, through viewership, through ticket sales. That's how you create a sustainable product and longevity in a sport. And that's the most pleasing thing about this. We won't sell out Madison Square Garden because all those people are going, oh, I'm going to buy a ticket to support women's boxing. They're buying a ticket to watch a great fight. This is Mayweather against Pacquiao of women's boxing. Undisputed champion against seven division world champion. It can only be a thriller. But you couple that with the history of Madison Square Garden never having a female boxer headline. The biggest female fight of all time. Puerto Rico, Ireland, you know, Brooklyn, Amanda Serrano, Jake Paul, me, the zone, you getting involved. And for the first time in a mega fight, I've never felt so much goodwill, mm. even in the boxing community, but particularly outside of that community, in sport, in entertainment. We've seen the WWE mm. really get behind this event as well. You, yourself, MMA, everybody. There's never a feeling of goodwill in a, in a boxing fight. Everyone hopes that it, someone pulls out or it rains in an outdoor show or that's the world that we live in. But this is very different and it feels great to be a small part of that. But also, you know, you want to get deeper and you talk about inspiring the next generation, inspiring athletes, young people. I have two daughters. I, I want to talk to them about this fight and show them two great athletes that had a dream, worked so hard and was told this wasn't possible. Watch them shine on Saturday night. You know, and, and even beyond young women, young girls, anyone who has a dream, anyone who's told it's not possible, anyone who works hard enough to achieve what, they, what no one ever thought could be done, on Saturday night, you're going to see it. And I always said to Katie, one day, one day you're going to headline the Madison Square Garden. You know, you're going to make seven figures and we're going to, but it's just something that I say. You know, I, I was part of her dream. I'll be very proud on Saturday night. You know, it's, it's, it's turning into, and I said to Bob Aram, and I said to ESPN, whatever you do, do not do a show on this night. You will get crushed. And we're seeing it before our eyes. Stevenson against Valdez, I'll give him some promotion now. Great fight. No one's talking about it outside of boxing. This is the moment, Saturday night, the world will stop to watch this fight. Luckily, they're not going head to head. It seems like there's some... But, but still, why go on the same night? No, no. The I fight was that. already announced. We were on sale. Yeah. Now, I agree with everything you said, and I share your enthusiasm. I have one gripe, mm. if I can. I don't like the two-minute rounds. Yeah. This was the fight to make it, and Amanda threw down the challenge. Katie, I spoke to her yesterday, the face-to-face. -face. Uh, she said it was a money thing. That was mm. her response. I want to get paid for three-minute rounds. Mm. So it sounds like... No, I think, to be honest with you... Women's boxing should be three-minute rounds, You know, you know rounds, what, no? I'll tell you one thing about the pay in women's boxing. The duration of the rounds has absolutely no regard for the amount of money these fighters get paid. I'm just saying, the perception is, it does. But That's what no, she said, by yeah, the way. Yeah, but there's actually no mm -hmm. commercial benefit, other than it's a nice story. You know, will a broadcaster pay more for three minute rounds? No. Will more people buy tickets for three minute rounds? Not really. So right now, if it's not broke, don't fix it, okay? In time, I agree with you, I think, we need to evolve and make sure that the very elite end of the sport is three minute rounds. But I will also say this, when you're introducing something into a market, fast paced content is always good. Mm -hmm. Now we've seen it with prize fighters, something we used to do when we were trying to grow boxing back to where it should be. You've seen it in cricket with 2020, other sports that are adopting that. Two minute rounds is great action, right? Because you've got two minutes. You know, you've got to win the round and they come out, the pace is much faster, but you will see more stoppages across three minute rounds. I didn't feel that now was the time we needed to introduce that. There'd be a lot more talk about it being a three minute round than actually focusing on what this is, which is a huge, huge fight. So I agree with you in time. Now that the audience for women's boxing is becoming more educated, more invested, I think we can definitely look at that. I have to say I'm a little blown away by the fact that Katie is the underdog as of right Slight now. Slight underdog, yeah. How do you feel about that? I like it. It's great being the underdog, isn't it? I mean, I've never seen her more focused for a fight. This is, you know, this is her garden, this is her house, this is what she's all about. And the last two fights, I think people look at her last two fights and say, hmm. maybe slight decline, 
motivation for me. You know, I think she would always say she's motivated, but this is what she's all about. You know, I just watched them down at the media workout. Serrano looks so strong, you know, huge puncher. Katie looks so fast, so determined. I'm going for a Katie Taylor stoppage in this fight. I think she's going to stop Amanda Serrano late in a thriller, but it will be a thriller, you know, only that. And that's been part of this whole journey with Katie, where proving the naysayers wrong, <sighs> women's boxing, oh, you know, my dad is a Hall of Fame promoter. If he's honest, when I started with Katie Taylor, he, he felt, felt as many bobs the same, women shouldn't box. You know, no, it's not not for me. He watched Katie Taylor. He's a fan from day one. Mm. So it's been easy for me to roll her out and give her the platform and say to people, just watch. And what I'm saying to you about Saturday night is just watch and you'll be a fan for life. Is there an immediate rematch clause? There's the, if a fight is commercially viable. So it's not immediate. You know, the fight has to warrant paying, you know, the numbers that need to be paid for the rematch. Personally, you may see this two or three times. It'll be that good. Um, but we want to win. And that's that's always what it comes down to, winning. You know, taking part's beautiful. I mean, we should always advise our children and all those wonderful people that it's great to take part, better to win. That's how, that's how I was brought up. And that's all that matters on Saturday night. Oh, it's amazing. Biggest fight in women's box history. What a moment for boxing. Win. Go out there and win. And she will do everything everything she can to win on Saturday. Uh, just a few more minutes left with you. I appreciate the time very much, despite the the tardy jokes. Um, I do want to ask you about Tyson. Tyson Fury mm -hmm. won last weekend. You were not there. Oh. He did call you the next day, yeah. rubbing it in and whatnot. You don't believe him that he's retiring, correct? And we're not just talking about retiring from, you know, he's saying I'm retired from the actual official bouts, but I'll do a Francis Ngani. You just don't believe him he's retiring, right? I don't really believe anything he says, but he's, <laughs> he also is capable of doing anything. Right. And ultimately, it's on him. If he wants to walk away from boxing now, good on him. It's a very tough sport. You know, he's made a lot of money, he's won the World Heavyweight Championship, and if he's happy doing that, good luck to him. I just feel that his biggest fights are in front of him. You know, like the, the, the real career-defining, legacy-defining stuff. Because there's a lot of talk at the moment about you know, him being a generational great and better than Lennox Lewis and, you know, these fighters of the past, he may be, but he ain't got a resume to prove it yet. He could do. If he beats AJ, if he beats Usyk or certainly the winner of that fight, he goes down as an undisputed champion, a Lennox Lewis style, you know, legacy, generational great. But he's a really good fighter. Like, sometimes people get it confused with, hey, I just feel that when you look at resumes... AJ's got a great resume. Is he a generational great heavyweight? No, but if he can beat Usyk and if he can beat Fury, he goes down as an all-time great. That's what he's chasing. But it comes back to our earlier conversation. What do you want? How bad do you want it? Maybe he don't want it anymore. But I would love to see Fury, who may well be in his prime, fight AJ, fight Usyk. You know, he's great for boxing. But, you know, he's, he's had his, a great run and maybe he's had enough, but I don't believe him. I, you know, the Nganu fight... So what do you think, I was just about to ask you about that. What do you think the chances are of that happening? It's a big fight, you know, I mean. You think it happens or do you think I, it's I just I actually talk? don't, no. I, you don't I, think I, it happens? I don't, but Why? I don't know the contractual situation. I think Tyson Fury's up with ESPN or about to be and, yep. and Garnu's up with the UFC. Maybe Dana comes in and does it himself. You know, maybe I do it with Dana or maybe, I don't, I don't know. Are you but, interested? Yeah, I'm interested in any big fight that does, that does big numbers. I'm not really interested as a boxing purist because it's a... You think it's a mismatch? Yeah, yeah. No chance Francis has? I mean, they're big boys. One punch can change everything. I actually prefer, I prefer Dillian White against Ngannou. Mm. Maybe with a little bit of mixed mixed hybrid rules, you know, because Dillian White's a kickboxer, he can he can grapple as well. And, you know, I don't know. But any, anything like that, it's exciting. I mean, Fury against Ngannou, Dillian White Who's against... Who's the baddest Ngannou. man on the planet? Yeah, Surely, oh, yeah. Big, once and big, for all. Yeah. I mean, this, this sells itself, yeah, right? it does. Big fight. Big fight, but it's the contracts. It's you know, I mean, can't imagine Dana doing a fight with Bob Aaron. Mm. You know, um, don't know how long the contracts are. Isn't Garnu going to resign? You know, you I, follow all these things. Not only in boxing, but you know, the Ngannou situation. I would be very surprised if Dana, if if Ngannou left the UFC without Dana White having some kind of involvement or control. Mm.
Now you mentioned AJ. Is 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 July twenty third a done deal? Him and Usyk. That's probably the the favourite date at the moment. Um, UFC planning on doing a show in yeah, London on yes. that day. I spoke to Dana. I how wasn't going to say anything because I didn't know that was common knowledge. But well, I spoke, I spoke, yeah, yeah, I spoke to Dana about it. Well, yesterday. how do you feel about this? Um, we're just talking about um, time zones, really. You know, and he was he said, "Look, I'm looking at that. Is that your date?" And I said, "It's not really done yet, but it could be a date." So we'll work around that. You know, if if that that date is actually a date that it would take place in the Middle East. So the main event would probably be closer to 9 p.m. So, you know, they could go Meaning later. yours? Yeah. Yeah. yeah which, Saudi? Possibly. Mm. Um, quite a few offers come in from there. And, you know, it's a split, this fight, financial split between the two. We, I'd love the fight in London. So would AJ, because we feel like it's a nice advantage as well. Yeah. But there's twice as much money, maybe three times as much really? money to do it elsewhere. And obviously, when Usyk's on a financial split of the deal, they're not going to just take it in London because AJ would prefer it there. So those negotiations are ongoing. You will see the fight in July, 100%. And, and AJ pumped for it. You know, he's he's ready. He watched the fight last weekend. He wants to get in there. So you guys won't be head-to-head, -head, basically, is, is I the think, I think the relationship, but, I mean, it's a different audience anyway, Ariel, to be yeah. honest But I feel like... like the, the, it's the, a the... massive... AJ Usyk is a huge fight for the UK. The whole UK will watch that fight. So whether... BT or whoever's airing that fight in the UK says, or oh, it's not a great day. I don't know. But, you know, I just said to Dana, let's have some dinner next week and um, we'll talk through it. The great thing about it is the relationship that we have mm. is a sensible one. So it's not like, right, oh, I'm, I'm not talking to him. We're going anyway. No, we're going anyway. And next thing, it's like, you know, so we'll, we'll work together to find a solution. And of course, you'll be in Vegas next week mm -hmm. for Canelo Bivol. Yes. And UFC has a huge pay per view next weekend as well. Are you going to be looking at, you know, we joked about the time I mean, that he had to sit it. in the back, yeah, yeah. but still, I mean, will you even be aware of what's going on? I think they're conversations that, that you know, they're, they're sensible conversations that should take place. And again, when you've got that kind of relationship, it's very easy for me to say to Dana, look, I don't know what time, you know, what time are you go and maybe we could just, you know, and we can help each other. You know, I mean, there's crossover to these things. They are different audiences, but ultimately there are crossover between UFC and, and fight fans. Um, of course. And it doesn't benefit anyone going head to head. But also we live in a world where there are so many shows. So much, I mean, how many UFC shows are there? It's like every week there seems to be a big pay-per-view that's conflicting with a boxing event. Every time Canelo fights, we, we, we see this. So Canelo is a beast in the ring and commercially. And it's almost one of them where you don't really have any fear against about what you're up against because that audience is incredibly passionate and you know it's, we obviously know it's a huge hispanic audience as well so but we'll, we'll we'll talk but i think probably it's a bit late in the day now to start looking at next week and um you know sometimes then that noise across social actually impacts and benefits the two shows Oh, who's going to go first? Or oh, what's he's waiting for him? Oh, the UFC waiting for Canelo. Oh, Canelo's going to ring. Oh, the UFC's holding their main event. Oh, Dana's watching the Canelo fight on laptop. You know, these these are this is noise that that reverberates around the world. So you know, um, I think uh, it's always always smart to have a sensible conversation. One last thing before I let you go, I'm just curious. You know, that Mick Conlon fight a couple of mm. weeks. I mean, one of the best fights that mm. I've ever seen. I was I was glued. I even brought my boys to come watch with me. I was like, just watch, mm. please mm. watch this. They're not big fight fans. They're young, ten and eight. But when you see the way it ends, is there any part of you? I know you love boxing, mm. and you know as we talk about you, the dad and whatnot. Is there any part of you that's like you get a feeling in your stomach? I don't know if I could stomach this. Thankfully, it all worked because out. Because of its brutality. Just the way it, it was scary there yeah, for a minute, I've, right? I've, I've um, you know, I remember when I was about ten or eleven. There was a fighter called Jim McDonald, and he was like one of my heroes. I used to go around his house, watch him train, like, you know, train with him in the gym and mess around. And he boxed a guy called Kenny Vice at Royal Albert Hall. And he got hit by a left hook, and he got knocked unconscious from the left hook. And he, his head hit the rope, which was where I was sitting. And he was unconscious. Back then, you know, in terms of the, the care for fighters from the governing body was really poor. Mm -hmm. He got carried out of the ring unconscious on a table and then went back to his change room, which I followed him in, and he was unconscious on the table for minutes with his eyes open. And I, I, was, I was here, I was 11. Wow. Now, I felt that he, he was dead. And Michael Watson's injury, I mean, you, you see it time and time again. And unfortunately, the passing of Patrick Day, you know, a, a few years ago in Chicago was, was on my show, and I witnessed, you know, 
all these things unfold. It's something that's very hard to explain to people. You know, when you talk about mixed martial arts or boxing, how do you convince someone that it's, you know, <laughs> that, that boxing, where the art of a fight is to render your, your opponent unconscious ultimately, or the same with MMA, or to, you know, to put him in a position where physically he can't breathe or he can't take any more. How do you explain that as, as a norm or something that should be allowed? But it's, it's, a, it's an unwritten code for people that take part in, in the sport where they understand the risks of the sport. Nothing ever makes it easier. Nothing ever takes away the pain of seeing someone getting injured in the sport. But brutally, it's something that is accepted when I went to the UFC London, I couldn't believe that people were celebrating teams when an opponent, I mean, when Molly McCann, yeah. you know, knocked that girl out, yeah. she was out. Mm. And Molly, you know, no, no disrespect to Molly, was running around the ring. Every, you know, whenever I get, Mick Conlon was a good example, got in the ring. I said to the guys, stop, calm, you know, and everyone stopped immediately. We waited for them to get medical care. But it seems to almost be more widely accepted in MMA because no one was bothered. No one was, like in boxing, there's a real feel in the community where the, the whole arena went hush yeah. for Mick Conlon, praying for Mick Conlon, and thank the Lord he was, he was okay. But in this environment, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Everyone was going on like, and, and a minute later, she's still unconscious on the floor, you know? So, no answer to your question. How do I feel about it? You know, when, when Patrick Day passed away, it took me a, a, quite a long time. I didn't know the young man. I'd met him at the press conference a couple of days before. Be beautiful young man. But if that happened to someone who was a friend of mine or I was closely associated with, it would be very, very difficult to take. But, you know, every show, you know, we, we have to thank these fighters and these warriors and we pray for them that whatever happens, and same with Taylor Serrano on Saturday night, we pray that both fighters leave the ring unscathed in what is a very brutal sport. We must keep evolving, keep doing everything we can to make the sport safer. You know, I talk about fighters getting carried out on tables. Now, you know, the medical care from the British Boxing Board of Control is outstanding, what they gave to Mick Conlon, straight in, oxygen. Still today, sometimes I go to commissions in America where they don't administer oxygen in the ring from, from when a fighter's in trouble. I can't believe it. The first thing a fighter needs in that situation is oxygen to the brain. Mm. You know, we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing for the safety of fighters. And, and luckily, particularly in the UK, that is, that is you know, we're, we're really at, at, at in a good place in terms of safety for fighters. It's always an honor when you stop by press conference tomorrow at the yeah. Hulu Theater. Can't believe it's only Wednesday. I mean, and, and you got you you know you did the face to face. Face to face. I think it's coming out tonight. I was yeah. told. I'm very excited about that. I'm also excited. Just a little teaser. I believe a face to face with Jake Paul and Eddie Hearn. And I'm I, you know I'm not going to go there right now. I'm going to save it for tomorrow. I feel like there's some underlying tension there between you guys. Really? I feel I like know. there's. I saw the real sports segment. I saw what you yeah. said. I've heard he's not too happy. I, I, I really? feel. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I feel I said, like there's something there. I promoted his debut. Yeah, I know. So I know. I started this mess. Yeah, but yeah. I don't. It was very. It was very cordial leading up. I feel like it's not really? going to be. Yeah. What do you think? I know That's you were with him we'll yesterday. We'll you were, do it for fun. He I, said I, yesterday he wanted to smash. You know, you guys were smashing oh, yeah, the yeah, cake. Yeah, yeah. He made a joke. I don't know if it went over. Oh, really? Well, not smash me. Yeah. Well, look, I'm 105 kgs. If I can lose another 10, yeah, I'll give him a fight in September. There you go. All you right. Know, maybe people will tune in. Thank you so much. Cheers, mate. See you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you for doing you. this. Really appreciate Thank it. You. There he is, Eddie Hearn, the head man over at Matchroom Boxing.